And what's happening in Algeria and maybe also like, you know, from the from the movement perspective, but also like, can you give us a sense, too, of the difference in terms of the regime in Algeria that's being uh, resisted against versus the one in Sudan? Yeah. Well, I know people, I think, want to make um, distinct the idea of what kind of parties, what kind of religious or relationships they have to religious institutions. Um, But I think at the end of the day, you see a really similar blueprint, which is what ended up happening after colonialism was shaken off was that there wasn't much transformation of the social order. Mm -hmm. So people who ended up taking positions as political elites um, were political elites during colonial times, or they were military figures. And I think that's what has gotten people into um, this cycle of successive regime changes that are sometimes violent, sometimes not violent military coups. Right. So um, with Algeria, you know, Algeria was liberated in 1962, and there was a a uh, leader by the name of Ben Bella, who was an inspirational figure for the globe. Um, and he was ousted in 1965. So that was a very short term. Um, and then, you know, successive regimes later, there was um, a civil war from 1990 to 2002, which was long and hard fought. And, you know, there's a lot of history written about the FLN National Liberation Front, or in French, uh, Front Libération Nationale. Um, And they're, you know, they were the resistance movement against the French. And they continue to be a big power player um, in Algeria. But the same with Sudan right now. The Algerians who did protest in 2011 because of rising costs for foodstuffs, and, and basics, um, they're back on the street because what Bouteflika did in 2011 is seeing what happened to his compatriots, his, the other dictators in the region, he ended up introducing spending mm-hmm. into the country. It's an oil-rich country, um, not wealthy oil-rich, part of OPEC. Um, so the people were, quote-unquote, appeased for a little bit, right? Um but now, after uh, Flika had announced that he was going to run a fifth term, and after there was already a constitutional amendment introduced that said a president can only run for two terms, um, and that it, was, it didn't include anything retroactive, so it meant that Buta Flika could continue to run and run and run. <laughs> and, right. Um, so folks were not having that, um, and went on the street in February and um, he resigned in early April and people within that same regime structure tried to continue to be a part of the transitional council and the people continue to be on the street. I think that's kind of the similarity with what's happening in Algeria and in Sudan, Um, you know, different economic states, um, clear you could talk about a different relationship to secularity and Islam. Right. But I think those things aren't as important as, you know, I'm a, I'm a multi-causal type of thinker. Yep. And I like thinking about all streams and intersections of... Yeah, uh, you're good for the Sam Harris Tribunal. Yep. <laughs> you're yeah, good. not just one, one, one um, matter of reason. But uh, I do think that in the West, we because we are not educated in the history of these places, we don't understand the lasting effects of what colonialism did. And there was a di- completely different colonial structure um, in uh, Algeria than in Sudan, um, because Sudan was kind of ruled by Britain and Egypt. So there are so many different layers of uh, what was happening there. But yeah. Well, that's no, that's I, you know, that's interesting because I mean we only have I want to get to like the kind of big takeaway and we'll definitely have more yeah. conversations. But I think that um, 
like that's that's just interesting though just time wise like i'll i'll draw like a big broad global connection because that's what i do without uh attention to specifics it's part of my job i'm just playing <laughs> but uh milton alamadi who we have on the show a lot who is an amazing uh ugandan journalist and a guy who specializes in like western africa and great great lakes region uh, and we did an illicit history of Thomas Sankara together for patrons, which is amazing. People should definitely check that out. You know, he did say like, there is this like emergent energy, like a couple years ago, there was something that they called the African awakening, right? Like, and that was kind of yeah. like less defined, but it was also just sort of like pointing to like that, okay, there's the liberation generation, but then colonialism gets reconstituted because the economic relationships don't really change and all these institutions like the World Bank and IMF and foreign capital come in. And then there's the political failings of all of these governments internally. And now there's like this new wave of activism that wants to sort of like have the, like the next wave of liberation basically. And I'm just wondering, like, do you think like that would be a more helpful frame? Like if there was going to be granted, people just need to be much less simplistic in general. But if we're but if people were at least able to start looking at like protests in Sudan, as an example, and instead of just kind of slotting it as like, oh, well, you know, there's just like another random protest happening in another random place with another random bad leader. They started to see, no, this is a sort of constituting of a new political energy of a uh, rising generations of people that have, you know, in some ways, actually in certain ways, maybe economic demands and senses of objections to austerity that aren't, at the very least, they're not alien to things happening in the West. Um, and there's a huge amount of political innovation and energy there that we could all draw from. Absolutely. Um, I think that what we could see this as as well, um, a really explicit refusal to accept neoliberal economic policies, yep. which is what they're suffering from, like the IMF coming in, introducing austerity measures, um, and also right-wing wealthy countries trying to support Sudan um, as long... I mean, there's a whole messy history of uh, Sudan, Omar Bashir sending Sudanese people to fight in Yemen because of the support he was getting from Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. So there's a refusal to be part of that um, th that devastating violence as well, um, because that involvement is also unpopular in Sudan. So then there's also this refusal to continue structures of colonial domination, which, you know, in the U.S., we don't think about colonial structures that we maintain from our settler, settler colonial projects at all, um, but they're recognizing what those are. And... I think another takeaway is that um, they do see these, um, they do see that the military is not the solution, which is a big shift from the 2011 moment. And that civilian rule, you know, most of the signs that you see, which there's tons of signs, chants, and art in Algeria and Sudan as part of protest culture, um, do say, uh, freedom, peace, and justice. Mm. Even as they are being tear gassed, hit with rubber bullets, killed on the streets, and being brutalized in hospitals, they, are, they know that civilian rule cannot come by violence. And I think that's different than the way that we romanticized armed struggle in the decolonial moment or decolonizing moment. And, you know, I adore Malcolm um, and I would never tell anybody what their struggle should look like, but there was a romanticizing of armed violence as being the only way to shake off colonialism. But we're in a different moment. Yeah, we're definitely like, even just for super practical reasons, we're in a very different moment. Um, Maitha Al-Hassan, Dr. Maitha Al-Hassan, She's a historian. She's a poet. She's an activist. You can find her at the Young Turks. You can find her at your college campus. You have a link to <laughs> all you. the ways that you can find her work. It's really, really, really important, really fascinating stuff. 
um, and well communicated in a way where all this complex stuff is actually very accessible, which is very rare. If you're like in this game, you know that that's really rare. So I really thank appreciate you your time. Me, yeah, thank you for letting me talk for like 90% of the time. Yeah, <laughs> that's your that. job. And also well done because I'm apparently I don't usually let that happen according to the feedback that I get. <laughs> <laughs> I do hear background chatter. I think I need to be in the studio to see people's faces. You like definitely that. need to be in the studio. Well, when you visit New York, you'll come in the studio, of course. Well, you'll be in the studio for the Sam Harris Tribunal. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh, please. Can we also have, what are they called? Little mantles? The, the, the um, uh, like the judge things. I'm oh, so yeah, sorry, the Mac, gavels. Please. But actually, Mac, gavels. Mac oh. can I get a little call to prayer, maybe? We could play some... Oh, oh my God, I can totally do an azan for Sam Harris. Yes. I want to really <laughs> Muslim this up. I want oh, to throw God. a lot of bad ideas at that guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm the mother load of bad ideas. All right, Maytha, I really appreciate your time. <laughs> we'll talk to you soon. Thank you Thanks so much. Thank you for having me, All Michael. Right. Take care. You've just watched a Michael Brooks show video, and you can watch all of our full main live shows every Tuesday night at around 7 p.m. Eastern time, and subscribe to get all of the clips you want. We're covering the globe. We're focusing on international relations, the intellectual dark web. We're having fun. We're doing deep dives with a lot of amazing guests. Of course, become a patron for the whole thing at patreon.com slash TMBS, or subscribe to this YouTube channel and help us keep growing and get that content out there. Subscribe below.